froze. We were frozen. I know. Riverside's on one this morning. Hi, everybody. Hi, Vanessa. <laughs> the behind, behind the scenes, BTS of recording. You um, were frozen giving me a dirty look, and I was like, what did I do? Why are you mad? <laughs> <laughs> oh, technology. Mm-hmm. So we're going to answer a question today. Um, I don't like the idea of like answering a question. I don't like, you know why? Because it feels like we're the quote unquote expert. And you know how I hate that feeling of being like, I'm the expert on this. Why do we call them conversation starters? Does that feel a little what bit more of a conversation around? This, this question's a conversation starter. Yeah. There we go. I like that. World renowned. <laughs> My partner and I's sex fluctuates so much. Hmm. I think it's normal. He thinks it's not. Most of our fights are about sex lately. I don't know how to resolve this issue. He used to be a porn addict, and now that he hasn't watched it in months, wants me to give it to him two to three times a day. Mm. I would dissociate during sex because I just felt like a sex object, and there were times where I said I wanted to stop, and he thought I was joking and continued anyways. I'm at the point where I just say no all the time because I feel like the intention is for him to release and not about connecting with me. We talked about it, but somehow still ended up fighting about it when I don't want to do it. We have kids and I can't imagine going our separate ways, but it's scary But because it scares him and maybe I'm not the one for him. Help. Hmm. How to navigate this issue that we keep facing. Well, Hmm. before we even get into the conversation, I feel compelled to say that when someone says, whether it's in the container of a partnership or otherwise, that they want to stop having intercourse and that person does not stop, that is called assault. Um, And so, you know, I think we just really need to name that because it's really important. Someone doesn't have access to you sexually when you say stop without that being a form of sexual assault. Yeah. I think that, uh, I mean, look, this idea of marriage absolving rape, I mean, there were laws that said that that wasn't the case up until pretty damn recently. I mean, some I think states, we, I think actually it's still, still is, the case. right? And even more liberal states, even like California, I think that wasn't until like maybe the 90s or something. It's pretty fucking mm-hmm. recent uh, that that wasn't a law anymore. So I think a lot of us still live under this um, idea that just because we are married or partnered, to your point, that that somehow takes that off the table. And we are here to say resoundingly that it does not. Um, The second you say stop, it doesn't matter at what point in the process you are in. um, If the other person does not stop, that is what we would call assault or rape. Um, And so I want to be really clear, just like, do you, you know, like you said, Danae, um, it's not a joking matter. It's not something to make light of. Uh, It's a hard stop. It's a hard line in the sand. Um, That's it, period. Uh, The the rest of the conversation, the rest of the question, um, I think is something that you and I have had a lot of conversations about as we've both been on our own kind of journey um, personally, but also with clients, you know, especially with women. Hmm. around sex and the reclamation of sex, the reclamation of our bodies, uh, sex in, I mean, at least in this case, we'll speak heteronormatively, you know, heterosexual relationships, uh, patriarchy, like what the patriarchy does to all of us, women and men, but in particular men and their relationship to sex. I feel like there's a lot of avenues that we could, we could take with this one. Yeah. You know, I think it's interesting that she named that he had a porn addiction. And Mm -hmm. what is often the case with any sort of addiction is that when we take away one sort of addictive behavior, what ends up happening is that we substitute it for another one. Um, When she says that she feels like an object, she's right to feel that way because she is. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a lot of ways that this is something that I'm seeing more and more um, men, and I really applaud the men that are having this conversation. Connor Beaton's been someone who's really been at the forefront from my perspective and like bringing this conversation to light around the ways that men have been conditioned to use sex as a form of self-regulation and um, that, you know, pornography and quite often intercourse with their partners becomes a way for them to sort of disassociate in the same way that they would using 
drugs, alcohol, any other sort of addictive substance, um, because there's actually like the same way of self-regulating that same sort of like bringing down the tension um, that you would experience if you were doing a drug. And so I think that's important to talk about in the context of this question, this conversation, because let's say my partner had a cocaine addiction and we have two kids, right? We would be having a very different conversation around whether or not to stay in this relationship, right? But in a lot of ways, I think it's important that we as women, but like as humans, really, because there's like a really dehumanizing effect to what we're describing here. Mm -hmm. um, I've had clients where I've had the conversation around like the level of abuse that I mm -hmm. find can be present in dynamics like this person is describing where this person doesn't hit me, doesn't physically abuse me, but one, like forces intercourse in a way that I'm not comfortable with, not like consensual to be a part of, but also does not really care that I don't want to be a part of this and I'm not enjoying this anymore. And to me, that is a form of abuse. When we cross the line into someone who is not an active participant, or this is something I don't want to be doing sexually, or even the amount of sex that we're having makes me uncomfortable. I really think that flirts. And I'm going to use flirt, like really like, um, I'm almost challenged using the word flirts mm -hmm. with. Um, into a form of emotional, certainly, but also physical abuse. Yeah, I think um, I think it's really important. You know, we, you and I, talk a lot about addiction as more of a broad societal issue, right? It's kind mm -hmm. of like in some way or another because we live in such a traumatized society. We're all addicts. It's like, what are just what are you reaching for, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and to your point, you know, this is what we would call, you know, an Al-Anon or an AA, we used to call this concept like the dry drunk, right? Somebody who gives up drinking, but doesn't do the work around why am I, why am I drinking? Um, and so they still act out in ways that are textbook, you know, alcoholic, but they just don't have the actual, uh, imbibing going on. Um, and so, I think even as a society, we look at addictions like, well, once I've stopped doing whatever the thing is, that means I'm not an addict anymore. And that is by no means the case. To your point, usually it just pops up in another form. And in saying that, if you're listening and you're like, oh, I can kind of um, understand the question or I can kind of like feel into a connection, but like there's not an addiction there. I want to say that in my experience um, as a clinician, a lot more people, I think, than we're actually saying to a certain extent have some form of sex, love, porn addiction. Um, because I think in a lot of ways it's more sanctioned than, mm -hmm. you know, drugs and alcohol have been culturally. And so whether it's porn or not, this idea of sex and love being a, exactly what you were saying, this way to regulate the self, this way to self-soothe. Um, you know, you and I talk a lot about, especially for men in a world where they've been taught they're not allowed to feel, right? And they can't express emotion. It becomes their only way to connect to their emotional self, their spiritual self, right? Um, it's very common, y'all. And it doesn't have to be like so black and white where somebody says, oh, you're a porn addict. Um, I think actually there's something to be said for a lot of the way our culture is when it comes to sex and love addiction. Yeah. And, you know, in hearing you say that, I think what's important to play with as we have the conversation is let's take the word addiction out of it, yeah. frankly, because yeah. I think if we normalize that all of us are addicts and right. our drug of choice can then be what does that even mean? a ton of things, like to me, the addiction becomes irrelevant. It becomes mm -hmm. more about the fact that I am self-regulating through the experience of sex, but also that, you know, there's something, and to your point, what has become so normalized that I like, I want to say like one out of three couples, but it's like, I almost want to say like every other Half, couple that yeah. I see, this is the the conversation. And if we're speaking heteronormatively, it is to your point quite frequently. Um, the man who is interested in having more sex, and I would say as a way to self-regulate, and it's an interesting thing that happens with the women. It's not only what this person is writing about where I'm not interested because it feels like it's not about me, but there's a way that um, it becomes a power struggle. And this mm -hmm. is the only way that I can reclaim some sense of power 
in this relationship dynamic. And so it becomes like, you will, I will have autonomy over my body because I don't feel that I have a sense of autonomy in this dynamic anywhere else. So this or is the one place. Life. <laughs> yeah. And certainly in society. And so I think there's just a lot more of like the power struggle that I feel like is what is important to talk about in this question, which is we are not in alignment. We are sort of like fighting against each other in a way that like, to me, that's the bigger issue than well, in this case, <laughs> there's a lot of issues with what's happening sexually, mm -hmm. but it's also like that there's a power struggle happening here and that it feels like this person's partner is really not present and seeing her in a way that, oh my God, so deeply hurtful and damaging. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think to what you were saying about how I have seen more men recently stepping forward to have the conversation around sex and what's that, what that's been like for them and what that's meant to them. Uh, and really just like witnessing a lot of men start to grapple with that, I think has been, I mean, shit, it's been refreshing to say the least, but I also want to say, you know, if you're in a container like this, where this is reminiscent of like what you're struggling with, um, what do you do, right? Like what's the mm -hmm. next kind of tangible step? Because, you know, she has said that every time I try to talk about it, it turns into a fight. Um, I guess, I mean, and I have some ideas, but I'd be curious to know what you think today. Like if you were working with her kind of as a client, like what would be like the first step, I guess, that you would have her tackle? <laughs> well, I'm going to circle back to like, if we're in the realm of addiction for a minute and if the drug of choice is sex, sex is off the table, right? So like, the one behavioral addiction where we can't take the thing away is any sort of food addiction because we have to eat to survive, but you don't actually need sex with another person to survive. Mm -hmm. So I would say it's really important to start to rebuild a relationship with us and our relationship to one another sexually that feels like it's not from like the space of coercion or pressure or some sort of like, you know, um, entitlement, frankly. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big thing for me is that I don't care if this is your husband, nobody is entitled to your body, period. Mm -hmm. And I want to say that again, nobody is entitled to access to your body. That's just, you get to decide whether or not you want to have sex with someone. I don't care if you're in a relationship with them or not. Um, I think there's a lot about you know, the power over a structure of patriarchy that has taught men, and this is not their fault, it's what they have been taught, but like that the trade-off for choosing to be with a woman is that you have access to her body forevermore. Yeah. That's not true. And so I would say it's really important to start as you would with any sort of behavioral addiction or any sort of thing that I have a compulsive need for, you have to learn how to self-regulate without it. So I would not, I would say we're not having sex, period. And I would say, like, let's do like they do with like meetings, like 90 meetings in 90 days, like 90 days, no sex. How you doing? Right. And I heard Dr. Oz say something once. I probably mentioned this before, but he was like, if you're not clear, if your relationship with something yeah. is problematic, take it away and then see for a while <laughs> and you yeah. it will become very clear. Now, if you tried to go 90 days without sex with someone who feels that they are entitled to have sex with you three times a day, I promise you some very significant things to look at are going to come to the surface. And that's very vital information. I mean, like that is not um, someone, frankly, who has like a desire for a lot of sex. That is a compulsion that she's mm -hmm. describing. That is mm -hmm. someone who is like compulsively using sex as a way to like be in their body. He needs mm -hmm. to learn how to self-regulate with something outside of you. So I would not have sex for 90 days. That's where I would start if this was a couple I was seeing. And, you know, here's, here's what's coming up. I I'm imagining with somebody who, and, and listen, this is me maybe putting, um, you know, I, I guess to kind of reframe this, like, I don't know this person, either person really, but if I'm somebody who has a struggle with a compulsion enough where I'm expecting it three times a day, number one, number two, when my partner says, please stop or, or no, I keep going. I'm, I would be very curious to see what happens when you tell somebody like that, we're not having sex for 90 days. Now, because we've already said that part of this feels abusive, mm -hmm. I would say that in this specific instance, there has to be a lot of safety precautions 
considered and put into play. Um, because in my experience, and honestly, I would say even my, my kind of clinical opinion, uh, if somebody is not stopping when their partner is saying stop, there's most likely abuse happening in other parts of the relationship. Uh, whether that's emotional abuse, verbal abuse, um, there's something else going on. Like usually when somebody, let's say, is smacking you, the smacking is not not only the only form of abuse, right? Like mm-hmm. there's an abusive structure at play here. Um, so I also want to name that. That would need to be an entire component to what we're talking about is like safety in this container. Um, but let's say you you know you are comfortable enough and and you have somebody who's willing to say okay let's go ninety days. Um, I would say both parties have so much work to do here because now I want to go back to the person asking the question and I want to say we need to start working on your sense of self Mm. within and without this relationship because part of it was like we have kids terrified to leave this could go a lot of different ways right this 90 days could happen it could be a real aha for the partner the partner could realize their compulsiveness they could want to go to sa meetings they could want to go into therapy right there's a lot of that would be great and also it could go the other way and so it goes the other way so what are we going to do now right um And this feels a little bit like when somebody says, well, I'm staying for the kids. And then we have a conversation of that's not always the healthiest decision for the kids. I still think we have a misconception and partly it's because societally we don't support mothers. We don't support single parents, but there's a lot of misconception I think out there still that it's healthier no matter what to stay together. And that is just simply not the case. Yeah. I mean, I absolutely agree. And, you know, there's that saying in the world of addiction that you can't have an addict without an Al-Anon. And so I think making this about this person's compulsion, and that's all we're talking about, I promise you there are some significant codependent tendencies at play here anytime someone is asking for sex two to three times a day, and that's something I'm even entertaining. And I say that with a lot of... um, you know, just compassion for what it is to be in a relational dynamic with an addict, but there's a level of, um, you know, whenever someone, even if to your point, even if we were to take away this thing for 90 days, there's a way that this is our dance and Mm -hmm. I'm almost going to like resist that person, um, getting well, because that Mm -hmm. like, I'm that caretaker. I'm that person who like, they need me. I can't like, they can't survive without me. Like there's some unpacking to do in the, the Al-Anon element of whatever this relationship dynamic is. And just like understanding what this is within myself that, um, doesn't have such a visceral reaction of, you know, um, like self-protection is like the word that's coming up, but that's not exactly what I mean. Um, advocacy, I guess. Mm-hmm. Like there, there's some work to do around like my sense of self-worth and how I advocate for myself and how I make certain things just not okay, you know? Yeah. And I would want to look at, like if I was working with her individually, I would want to go back and see where these kind of patterns have happened in the, most likely all the rest of her relationships, right? And uh, maybe not the sex component, but her showing up and taking part in relationships where mm-hmm. her personhood is not considered, mm-hmm. where she is an object, where she is just a caretaker or a doer, um, and where she doesn't feel like she has a voice or you know, where she doesn't feel loved and like she's lovable enough to speak up and advocate for herself. And I would really want to go into some of these patterns that most likely started in childhood as they did for many of us, um, that led us down a path to be in a relationship such as the one that we're in. Right. Um, because to your point, I mean, this is, there's a lot of heavy lifting codependency for the person asking this question. Uh, and I think a lot of times we can, what's the word I'm thinking of? Demonize, I suppose, the person who's got the quote unquote addiction in the relationship. Mm -hmm. And so often you and I will say, it's like, we've got to keep our side of the street clean. I mean, that's what Al-Anon's all about, right? Like, I mean, I remember the very first Al-Anon meeting I ever went to and they were like, we're not here to talk about their disease. We're here to talk about you and your disease. And I was like, what? First of all, 
I do not have a disease, right? Like I was so upset about that. And then the more and more I started doing the work, the more and more I was like, oh shit, I got a lot to unpack about myself here, you know? Um, but I do think for a lot of us, it's easier to hide behind, this is the sick person. This is the person who has the problem. And so let me put all the emphasis there, right? Um, also, I think there's a way that we, I say we, cause I mean, been there and still I am as the kind of resident codependent, <laughs> but uh, we get to be justified in this feeling of resentment and feeling taken advantage of and feeling um, angry about the fact that, you know, I'm not considered and I am in a relationship with somebody like this and how dare they. And um, there's a lot of power in that in a way. Mm. Um, almost like power and victimhood, right? Like I get to have this, uh, I get to have ownership of this, what's the word I'm thinking of? Um, storyline, the righteousness. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the identity. That's the word I was going for. There's something about the victimhood identity that can actually be very powerful, which Ugh. sounds counterintuitive, but, but there's truth to it, right? When you really yeah. unpack it. Um, so if that's the thing that I'm holding on to, and that gives me some sense of power or some, some sense of self, um, or identity, then there's a lot of work to do there too. Yeah. That's such a potent thing that you just said. And I think what I have come to understand about the victim narrative is it does become a really potent distraction because the minute I realize that the the bars that are in front of me are open on either side and I could leave at any time. I'm not trapped in this dynamic. This is something I am choosing to stay in. And that's a really challenging thing to say because, you know, even as we're having this conversation, I'm so aware of, as you spoke to, so much of this is the air that all of us have been breathing. Mm -hmm. Codependency is so unbelievably normalized as what I would say is the most prevalent drug of choice in our society. I do believe that codependency is a behavioral addiction. Mm -hmm. And Amen. I think that um, there's a way that this is just, you don't leave or you failed or, you know, like you do everything you can because you have kids. All of these things are things that all of us have been bred, born and bred, like conditioned to believe are true. And the thing that's tough about the minute I challenge the victim narrative within myself that's tough because then I got to do something about yeah. it. Yeah. Right. Like then I'm choosing to be here and that's okay. That's where the like really a scary thing comes in because it's not so scary when it's like, well, I don't have a choice. I have kids with this man. I don't have a choice. This is like the bed I have to lie in. It's like, well, if I, if that's not true and I can leave at any time, then I got to do the really scary work of now what? Mm-hmm. Oh, this is a big one. I can feel mm -hmm. this one in my body. I feel like I, I just, in some form or another, I feel like I've worked with so many people struggling in different variations and, you know, levels of this. And I, I think that the reason why you and I both have been seeing so much more of these kind of questions and conversations is because we are starting to challenge the norms and is because patriarchal systems and ways of thinking are starting to crumble. And, it's going to be hard y'all like it, it, there, you know, with the crumbling of something, there is going to be struggle and there is going to mm -hmm. be, um, a lot of unknown because, you know, it's like, I always say, we don't have anybody to look to that's done it before that we can use as like a guide. Yeah. Generationally, we kind of are the, the way showers, right? Like we are the ones that are challenging a lot of the norms that it's been generations and generations. I mean, we one could say 4,000 years of patriarchy, right? And so we've got no one to look to that's done it differently. And so just, mm -hmm. I say that out loud to say, if you're feeling like, holy shit, this is an up uphill battle, it's cause it is, and you're not alone in that, you know? It doesn't mean that it's work that we stop doing, but it's just to like normalize, like it's a heavy load to lift when you've got no one to look to um, as a guide in front of you. Yeah. And I think, you know, I'm feeling a little bit compelled to speak to the need for support in yeah. this dynamic because again, like some, something's not sitting well. And I think we're both feeling it yeah, a little bit yeah. in our body. Something's not sitting well with me and that like something about this feels abusive to me. Abusive, and so I yeah. really want to advocate for this person getting support. And if it feels like it's really hard to have the support of friends and family, if there's been isolation, that type of thing, then, you know, we're talking a lot about Al-Anon. There's Al-Anon meetings 
everywhere in the world, but also online at this point, you know, Mm -hmm. um, like codependency, anonymous meetings, like there are ways to get support with how to start to navigate advocating for yourself and that you have other options other than continuing to stay in a dynamic that is hurtful. And so I just want to name like that can be like the bridge and the first step if it feels scary to even talk to, you know, friends and family about what the truth of what's happening is. There are other ways for you to start to get some support. Yeah. Yeah. Support. Try to find support for yourself, I would say, first and foremost. Right. And uh, the rest of it, the rest of it will happen as as it happens and it will unfold as it unfolds. Um, But I think it's hard to do that without that support. And so I would say that needs to be step one, actually. Yeah. Great. 